so you guys can hear me, right? All right, good. Can you remember the most ridiculous thing you've ever said? Like something so incredibly insane that as the words left your mouth, you couldn't believe what you were hearing yourself say. Well, I remember that day for me. It was two years ago, actually February of 2014. And those words were, my name is Dan Nevins, and I'm a yoga teacher. <laughs> yeah. Which is not, it's not insane to be a yoga teacher. It's actually amazing to be in a profession that empowers people, to be into their greatness, whether it's in a pose, whether it's on the mat, or off the mat. It's great to be in a profession where you can provide tools for people to get back in touch with their breath, to get out of their head and into their body and to live a life with purpose and meaning and integrity and honor and all those things. So why was it ridiculous for me to say? Well, that's probably because of who I was the previous 40 years. You know, I grew up back in Baltimore in a not-so-great neighborhood, and family wasn't something that I resonated with. I didn't really have a lot of love at home, came from a broken family, living without a lot of means. And I remember watching the Gulf War unfold. It's 1991, Desert Shield's happening. And I remember saying, like, that's a family. Everybody wearing the same uniform with the American flag on their shoulder, going to protect our way of life overseas. And I knew I wanted to be a part of it. So I joined. And then the war was over before I even left for training, which is great. Short wars are great. This one, not so short. And I remember I did eight years of active duty, and I loved every single minute of it. I loved the people I got to meet, how I got to serve, but I wanted more. So I left the service went to college, but stayed in the National Guard because I couldn't give up that uniform, which was an everyday part of who I was. It was the uniform in which I learned to be a man. I learned about values. I learned a lot of things in that uniform, but it was time to move on, and so I did. And I got a great job. I was a stockbroker. I was selling pharmaceuticals. Life was amazing. And then, the then well, 9-11 changed everything. Three years later, I found myself deployed to Iraq. And I was a soldier. I was a leader of other soldiers. And it was a privilege to put on my uniform and lead them in combat. Nine months I spent in combat in Iraq. Until a fateful day, November 10th, 2004, where I was about to head out for a 72-hour dismounted counterinsurgent operation. The Battle of Fallujah was going on, and I was in a place called Balad, Iraq, and there were coordinated assaults ongoing throughout the theater, so we decided to meet the enemy where they were, and that's exactly what we prepared to do, and heading out for that mission, boom! My life was changed forever by an improvised explosive device that detonated beneath my vehicle, took the life of my very good friend, Sergeant First Class Mike Adelini, who I wear this bracelet for every day to remember the man that he was. What he taught me, not only as a soldier and as a leader, but just as a human being. I remember I was in a prayer right before the explosion happened, and then when it went off, I could feel and hear the pieces of the truck basically disintegrate around my body. And when I opened my eyes, I realized that I'd been ejected from the vehicle, but my legs remained caught in the twisted and burning metal that used to be the floorboard and undercarriage of the truck. I remember as the dust descended, I looked forward to the front of my vehicle, the driver's compartment, where I noticed Sergeant First Class Mike Adelini had made the ultimate sacrifice. It was very clear. I went to work on myself, we stopped the bleeding, I was in a helicopter and into the combat surgical hospital in the heart of Iraq, and I woke up and I remember there was a combat nurse's face right in mine and she said some things I'll never forget. She said, Dan, you're a very lucky man. 
We managed to repair your femoral artery, which was cut in half from the explosion. We had to take your left leg below the knee. We managed to save your right one for now, but you'll probably lose that one too. And then right about the time I was about to feel sorry for myself, I looked up against the wall of the tent, and there was my whole team just waiting for me to wake up. And instead of feeling sorry, we laughed, we told some jokes. I talked about returning the roller skates I got for Christmas, and I didn't get roller skates for Christmas, but that pain medicine was really good. <laughs> and we told stories. We talked about Mike. I fell asleep, and I woke up for a two-year journey of 36 different surgeries, learning to walk again. And early on, dealing with what that nurse said is, I lost one leg and probably the other. What can a guy with no legs do? And in my mind, it was nothing. I was a physically fit, top of my game, 31-year-old staff sergeant kicking in doors and chasing down bad guys. And now I was broken and useless, laying in a hospital bed with nothing left to give. I was a competitive runner, and running was what my, my wife and I did together. And that was going to be gone forever, too. And how would she love me anymore? And then my daughter, she was 10 years old. I used to throw her on my shoulders and run around and do those things that dads do with their kids. Now that was going to be gone. And how would she even respect me as a father anymore? I had those early moments setting myself up for a lifetime of disappointment and loneliness. And then I was met at my hospital bedside by an organization called Wounded Warrior Project who changed my life providing opportunities for me to learn that my disability didn't define me, that I had the chance to define what the rest of my life was going to be like, that I got to write the next chapter in my book, and they were there every step of the way. And for the next decade, that's exactly what I was doing. Those two years, I healed physically from the war, but I learned tools to self-medicate, to not address the wounds that you don't see the ones here and here. I was climbing mountains and riding my bike all around the world, and I was doing things and, and self-medicating with achievement and conquests and service and leading a team, and I was an executive, and I had uh, authority and control and all those things that we learned to grow up and do, especially as a poor kid in Baltimore. And then I had a surgery two years ago, where I couldn't wear my right leg. I ultimately lost my right one, too, due to constant infections and a lot of pain. So I had to get a revision, and I couldn't wear my leg, and I was recovering at home alone. And I couldn't self-medicate. I couldn't lead my team. I wasn't even allowed to answer my email. I couldn't take care of my new three-year-old daughter because I just couldn't get around well on crutches and one prosthetic leg. I had eight weeks at home alone with my thoughts, and those negative thoughts and experiences from combat haunted me, and they didn't go away. In my decade of service and veterans' issues, I have learned a lot of statistics, like the 400,000 that live with PTSD, the 320,000 that live with a traumatic brain injury, the over 52,000 that have been physically wounded, in the global war on terror, all whose lives have been changed. And I identified with the brain injury, because I do. I have a traumatic brain injury. It's much better now, but it's still a built-in excuse for forgetting things, so it's great. <laughs> so I don't have to admit getting old. It's not because I forgot it because I'm 43. It's because I forgot it because I just blamed my brain injury. And then everyone feels sorry for me, and I get a pass, so it's awesome. <clears throat> So I, I just remember being in that constant state of why won't this go away. There was the one statistic that I never identified with of all those statistics, and that was 22 veterans take their own lives every day. 22. And I never understood it because I was of the mindset of, hey, why don't you just not do that? Right? Find something, do something, get off the bed, get out of the couch, go, you know, go get out of the house, get off the couch, go do something. 
I remember when I was dying, laying there, losing what seemed like all of my blood and going to work on myself, I realized that, Dan, I'm alive, I'm alive, I better do something. And I did, and I lived. And this was no different, but being home alone for eight weeks, I couldn't do anything. And I needed help, and I didn't want to call my friends at Wounded Warrior Project because they probably would have sent in a SWAT team and like fire trucks and a helicopter. It wasn't that bad. So I called a friend, and she said the dumbest thing I've ever heard a human being say to me. Dan, you need some yoga in your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was like, no, listen, don't be offended, because this is who I was, not who I am. And I said, are you crazy? I'm a dude. <laughs> right? Like, I own guns, and I eat meat. <laughs> and, and I don't own any spandex. I don't have a man bun. I mean, like, I, w I would if I could. I can't. <laughs> it's not for me. So she suggested meditation, and I could palate that. And I had instant results. Not only did those negative thoughts go away, but every thought, the quality of every thought improved. And I made the mistake of calling her and saying, hey, Anna, thank you so much for introducing me to meditation. I'm having like this great success, and I was telling her about it. And she said, well, don't you think you owe me some yoga? And I agreed. And I remember going to my first three private lessons. That was my commitment, three private lessons. And I take commitments very seriously. And I remember going to my first lesson with Anna, and it was as miserable as I thought it was going to be. I had two prosthetic legs, and I was reaching in these poses. And like, this is not how I do yoga, by the way. But I'm like, this is how I was doing yoga. And I'm standing there. and. My prosthetics are digging into my leg, and I couldn't get my body in the right position. And she was saying things that didn't make any sense, like, root down, rise up. And I'm like, what does that mean, root down and rise? Where am I going? This is not. And it was painful, and I was mad at her, and it wasn't okay. And I left that class very angry and uh, mad that it wasn't working for me, because how could yoga be this hard? It was like taking away my man card twice. One, I was in yoga. Two, I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. So now we go to the second, the second class, because I'm going to follow through with my commitment. We're at the second iteration of torture. And halfway through, I said something I couldn't believe I said. I said, Anna, can I... Um, I'm going to try this with my legs off. And she looked at me and said, oh, okay, we'll figure it out. And what's important about this is uh, for you to know is that no one got to see me with my legs off. I had such a connection to my old legs, who I used to be. We've all probably played that game of, like, what's your favorite body part? And if you're saying no, you're probably lying. So integrity is big in this community, so we should just admit it. So some people say our eyes, our smile, our butt, whatever it is, they'll say their favorite body part. Mine was their legs, my legs. And they were gone. And what was left was disgusting. The muscles atrophy and there's scars and they don't get any more sun and it just looks like a shadow of what used to be. And eventually, with time, that got replaced by these new prosthetic legs, which were kind of cool, looked like a robot. Kids liked them, it was great. Um, chicks liked them too, which was weird. <laughs> I'm not married anymore, by the way, so I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> and I remember um, having this new sense of pride in these prosthetics, and now I'm, I'm doing it I'm offering to do it without them. And I remember she's standing behind me, and I'm on my mat, and I'm attempting to get into Virabhadrasana 1, Warrior 1, 
pose, and I'm just situating, I'm on my knees, and I'm replaying, and she's like looking at me, probably figuring out how am I gonna teach this guy to do these postures, these poses without legs on, and I remember having this moment, I'm sitting in this posture on my mat, and, I, and I'm going up into this pose, and I re remember hearing her say, root down, rise up. And I plugged in for the first time in 10 years. And a surge of energy came from the earth into my body and lit me up from the inside out, and I exploded in this posture. And it was the best feeling I've ever had. It was like the earth was saying to me, where have you been for the last 10 years? And the next day and a half, I just learned how to adapt every pose. And I went to my first yoga class two days after my last class, and I was so excited to go. And I walked in, and I saw where I was going to put my mat, and there's about 30 people in there, and I hit this wall. And I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't breathe. My ears were humming. My vision was shifting in and out, and I was losing my breath. I think I was having a panic attack. I don't know what that, I've never had one. I don't, I've never had one again, thank God, but this is what I was going through. And I was saying to myself, Dan, why? Why? What's happening? And then I realized I had to take my legs off in front of 30 strangers. And somehow I found the courage to go to my mat and take off my legs and go through the most miserable practice of my life because I felt every laser beam eyeball in that room drilling into the back of my head, and I heard the voices saying, why is he here? How can I practice next to that? I'm distracted, I'm, I'm in my head now, I'm, I'm not in my practice, all these things that I was learning, and I was the distraction in the room. And as soon as that practice was over, I just couldn't get my legs on fast enough. And one by one, people came over, not to tell me how hideous I was, but how inspired they were. A week later, I was in yoga teacher training. <laughs> and when we graduated, I said those words, my name is Dan Nevins, and I'm a yoga teacher. <laughs> and I posted a picture on Facebook, and all my army buddies couldn't wait to tell me how stupid I was. <laughs> Dan, is there anything you don't want to ask or not tell us about? <laughs> yeah, you got it. That's fine. Yeah, but so, yeah, that, but that's how we do. Like, we love each other, and that's how we love each other in the brotherhood of the veterans community. And that's something I want to point out about veterans is you know, there's this kind of stigma out there of PTSD and what that's like. And I want to say my experience of the people that I've had the honor to serve with is they do not serve to be some sort of Billy Badass, I'm going to go shoot them up, blow up things, and hurt people. The people that I've been privileged to serve with, they serve because they love you enough. They love us enough to put on a uniform and go fight tyranny and oppression and terrorism where it is versus allowing it to come here. I love the people that I had to serve with and I love humankind. And I don't want to pick up a weapon, but I will, because what we get to do here is important. And what I learned through the power of yoga is that I can share what I've learned with people like me, people who don't think yoga is for them. I get the privilege to teach yoga all around the world, and when I teach people who aren't veterans, I have a simple message, and that is invite a veteran to yoga because you just might save their life. It's my greatest honor to have served and worn the uniform in service to my country. I can't imagine replacing 
the dignity of what it means to have led others in combat in service to the things that we hold in high regard that the rest of the world, or some of the world, doesn't. But I can say as a yoga teacher, this is the most important work I've ever done. And this work changes and saves lives. So my request for all of you, whatever your practice is, your source of wisdom, be it ancient or modern, whatever it is that you do, invite a veteran to be a part of it. Because you may just save their life. Thank you very much.